Hey, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome, Faith Outreach Community Church. We also welcome those who are out in the, in the internet there too, and Facebook and the website, www.faithoutreachcommunitychurch.org. Uh, we're just so grateful that you would come together with us today, virtually, and those who are here specifically, we're just so grateful. So we want to give honor and praise and glory to our great God, because he is so worthy, so worthy. Just, you know, we just think about who he is, who he is, amen. Before, before he even created us, who he is, worthy of all glory and praise and honor. And all the heavenly hosts that are there, you know, just giving him honor and glory. And because he deserves that, amen. And it's a, it's a bit of a delusion if you don't give him praise because somehow you think he doesn't deserve it or somehow you think you're equal to him. That is delusional. And we want to help people be disabused of that delusion, amen? Not, you know, just to help them know who they are, who God created them. God breathed the breath of life in them, made them in his image. It's his creation, amen? It's the, the, the beauty of all that we look around and we see, you know, in, in this universe, all that God has done. We're here, to, we're breathing his air, we're eating his food. We, everything that we are is from him, amen? As they, you know, back in the, I don't know, I grew up in Presbyterian and we used to sing something like, all things come from thee, O Lord. And of thine own hand, I give it back to you. Amen. Everything we are is because of him. And we need to give him praise and honor and glory. So I, I invite you to come along and let's, let's, let's give him the victory. Amen. Let's, let's say, hey, thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. We come to praise you, O great God. Yes. And lift his holy name. Come on, church. Yes. So we come to praise him. We come to praise him. We come to praise him. And lift his holy name. Amen.
and we have Alpha and Omega, the first letter and the last letter, and God is everything from beginning to the end, amen. That's why we sing this song, because this is who he is. You are Alpha.
we give God praise because he is so worthy. We're not here by form or fashion, but we're here serious mindedly to lift up the name of Jesus because he is worthy to be praised. Let us go before the Lord, eternal God, our Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Master, we come this morning lifting up your holy and righteous name. If it had not been for your son, Jesus, where, oh, where would we be today? So we thank you, Lord. We ask that you look down from your heavenly throne and send your anointing upon these, your people, oh God. We ask, O oh God, that as your word comes forth this morning, O oh God, it might come forth powerful and mighty, that it may, O oh God, allow us to be moved from one destination to another. And I said that to mean thus, that we shouldn't leave here the way we came in. Hallelujah. So we thank you, God Almighty. We ask that you stretch forth your healing hand, touch the sick, shut in, and the bereaved, oh God. You know who we are, oh God. And Father, we ask that you would be there and there present this very moment, oh God, and forevermore, oh God. We ask, oh God Almighty, that you will bless the preacher man as he comes forth with your undul undulterated word, that it might bless these, your people, oh God, on this great getting up morning, oh God. Good God Almighty, we thank you, Jesus, for you've been mighty, mighty good. You've been better to me than I can be to myself. Oh, we lift up your glorious name today because you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. In the powerful name of the name of Jesus, be praised. Let the church say amen.
ongoing church ministries and meetings. Uh, please continue to actively participate in these ministries to further your spiritual growth. Intercessory prayer every Wednesday night at church from 5.30 to 6.30. Please see Pastor Celia if interested. Let us pray a God-inspired women's group. This meets every Thursday at 7 to 9 p.m. Currently studying a book called 21 Days of Deeper Prayer. Um, it is very easy to participate. We have a login for Zoom platform so you don't have to actually be a member of FOC to enjoy um, in this fellowship. FOCC Men, the first Saturday of each month at 9 a.m., reading and studying Kingdom Men Rising by Tony Evans. Please see Pastor Tom if interested. For those who are on our social media platforms and would like to participate in our men's or women's ministries, please go to our website under the Contact Us button. At the top of our webpage, we will provide, um, excuse me, you can provide your name, email address, and a message stating the information you would like to participate um, in or the ministry you'd like to participate in, and we will be happy to provide you with that and the login information. Um, as a friendly reminder, we ask that all prayer requests be submitted the Friday before our services to Pastor Tom, and that email address is tj5050 at verizon.net, and we um, appreciate you uh, transitioning in this from Pastor Lloyd. Today's sermon will be given to us by Senior Pastor Tom Logan, and it is entitled, "God, excuse me, Who is God? Part 13, God's Life and Immortality. And uh, one more note, um, Aunt Dee has an unclaimed offering envelope that she's been holding on to. If this was yours or you know anything about it, please see her after services. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So good to have those praise reports. Amen. To hear um, such by Kimon and, and Mariah. Um, hallelujah. You know, I look through the word, and, and every there's a there's a continuing narrative in, in the word where, you know, first of all, God is, and and that's sufficient. And but He creates, you know, He 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 creates the universe. He creates us. We, you know, gives us everything that we need, and we've decided that we think we're going to to be like Him without Him somehow, and and just do our own thing. Amen. But not only that, he, he, he knows this, he provides a way back to him, amen. And I just, it's such a great, a great love that he has for us, amen. And I just want to give him praise today, and I, amen. Hallelujah. Scares can 
Beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you, Hamp. That was very nice. Everyone loves that song. How great thou art. Wow, that's, that song's been around for a long, long time, and you just never get tired of hearing it because it's honoring and giving glory to God. How great thou art. Wow, that, that's just so nice. Well, welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming out today. It's a little bit warm. Now we're getting into the warmer temperatures in the month of June. Hopefully, uh, in here, it's comfortable. If it's not, you can make yourself comfortable by taking off something or adding something on. Just do it in moderation, of course. Amen. We extend a warm welcome to all of you who are watching by our uh, church's website on YouTube or other platforms, social media platforms. We're just so grateful that you're here with us and it just give us great honor and glory that we could come together. We could praise and worship God together. What a wonderful thing that is. You know, God loves to see his people come together. If you have children or grandchildren, one of the great joys you get out of that is seeing them getting along with each other and, and having fun with each other and, and just enjoying themselves. And this is how God looks down on us when he sees us assembled together and worshiping and praising him. It brings great joy to, the, to God's heart. And it makes it so nice. That's one of the reasons why we encourage people to come out and be in the congregation rather than just being home on social media platforms. Of course, we know that there are people that have to be there uh, at home. And we thank God for blessing us with the opportunity and the technology where we can uh, observe services on platforms, social media platforms. <laughs> But if you can come out, please do so. Amen. Because it's much more effective. It means so much more to God. And of course, it means a whole lot more to us. 
So if you can come out, then always uh, be, there, be able to do that. We're continuing our series on who is God. Last time we did uh, part 12. This is part 13. As a reminder, we know that God tells us to get to know him. He wants us to get to know him. And not just in a, a cursory way, but in a detailed way, in a, in a very intimate way. He wants uh, us to get to know him. So we are uh, on this series where we can get to know God. And we do this prayerfully that God will uh, help us to use the attributes which we are going through. That we can use those as we think and everything we say and everything that we do. This makes us more effective servants to God and better help to each other as we serve each other. So uh, we are prayerfully doing that. We've gone through about 20 of these already. We have about nine more to go through and we expect to complete those in about four more sermons. And uh, then after we're done with that, we're going to kind of wrap it all up and we're going to look at a number of questions uh, which we can answer Christians have certain questions that they've asked all of their lives. We all have them and have not gotten answers to. But we're going to look at a lot of these questions and see how we can know the answer to these questions just as a result of knowing the attributes or studying the attributes of God. And you'll be surprised to know how much you have learned over this series which started last year in July. So we're going to be continuing with these for the next uh, couple of sermons and then we're going to wrap it all up with a, uh, a sort of summary, if you will, and we're going to look at some of the questions and see some of the things that we can answer automatically just from knowing the attributes of God. Today we're going to continue with part three. Last time we did uh, God's majesty, his beauty and ineffability. We said that his majesty is his unsurpassed greatness and his unparalleled exaltation. We said that it was his unmatched glory. That's the majesty of God. We said his beauty is such that if you were to look on God, if you were to see him, you would be overwhelmed with a sense of pleasure and delight just to look at him. And the psalmist said all he wanted to do is just one thing, just be in the kingdom so he could just gaze at God. He says, this is the one thing that I want. Now that says a lot, doesn't it? We also see a taste of God by looking at the beauty in his creation. Uh, we can see the beauty of uh, uh, the ocean rising and the sun setting over the mountains and so forth we went through last time. So there is beauty. Even though the universe had been corrupted by the evil one, the devil, we still see beauty in the universe. It gives us a little taste of what's going on. Then we talk about God's ineffability, which simply means it's really not an attribute of God because it's not intrinsic to his nature. But the ineffability is a word that we use to explain that there is no human language that is sufficient to describe God. None whatsoever, whatever language we use, because he, all human languages are finite, which means they're limited. God himself is infinite, which means he's unlimited. So you can't use the finite to describe the infinite, not fully and comprehensively. So uh, that's what we talked about, about when we said uh, ineffability. That's what we mean when we say that word. Today we are going to talk about two more attributes of God, God's life and his immortality. His life and immortality. We're going to see what they are. We're going to look at the scriptures that give us support for this. And then we're going to see how we could benefit from knowing about God's life and immortality. So let us first begin by going through to the throne of grace in prayer. Great God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you blessed us that we can convene together here today in the name of Jesus. Thank you for providing us with this facility. Thank you for providing us with technology. Thank you for giving us the means where we, can, where we can expound on your word. And Lord, we just ask that you will bless us, that we will all benefit significantly from what you're giving us today. We pray that you'll move me out of the way, Lord, and speak to all of us directly uh, so that we can learn and grow with what you have to tell us here today. Use me as an instrument in your hands, Lord, and bless these words that they will go forth with power, with might, with accuracy, and everything will be done according to your glory. We pray that you will bless the, uh, the technology, the video, the audio for those who are on social media platforms, that they too will benefit and there will be no interruptions at all in these things. So we just thank you now and pray to you and ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus, and we say amen. 
Now we said that God wants to, us to get to know him in an intimate way. So he provides means for us to do just that. And, and one of the benefits we get from that is because knowing God is the only way that we can truly know ourselves. And I do mean the only way that we can truly get to know ourselves. You might think you know yourself pretty good, and you know, you, you know, people, we have a tendency to say, I know me, you don't know me that well, but I know me. Well, you don't know yourself as good as you think you do. You could know yourself and you compare yourself, well, we compare ourselves with each other. Oh yeah, we know ourselves pretty good. But when it comes to comparing ourselves with Jesus Christ, we see how far short we fall. We don't know much about ourselves as we think we do. So we study these attributes and one, that's one of the benefits. We really get to see ourselves as who we really are. And uh, this was a lesson that was God taught the prophet Isaiah. So we're going to look at that and see what uh, how Isaiah learned this lesson himself. God showed Isaiah a vision of his throne. Isaiah saw this vision of God's throne, and what he saw was angels around the throne, seraphim. Seraphim was a certain class of angels, and these seraphim had six wings. Two wings, they covered their face. Two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they just flew around God's throne. And they were saying, holy, holy, holy. So let's just look at that and see what happens and, and how, how Isaiah was able to uh, determine how, where he fell short at. So uh, these are the angels around God's throne, the, the seraphim that he saw. And notice what he said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. These are the angels now flying around God's throne. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now Isaiah wrote this, and he saw this vision uh, of God's throne, and he saw these angels flying around the throne just saying, holy, holy, holy. And the, the, the doorposts of the temple were shaken, just shaken just from all of this ceremony that was going on. Then the whole temple area began to fill with smoke. Isaiah saw this and he said, whoa, I'm undone. Woe is me. What Isaiah was really saying is that he was falling apart. He was unraveling just to see this marvelous, glorious sight. He never thought that he could see such a thing. And what happened is he, he was becoming undone. So he said, woe is me, which means he was afflicted and troubled. He was unraveling and falling apart just to see the glory of the God around that throne, you see. You see, you have to understand Isaiah. Isaiah was a devoted, dedicated prophet of Jesus, of God. And what Isaiah had done, he just got through pronouncing woe on the Judeans, the people of Judah. So he was telling them, you know, you guys are sinful, you're wicked. God said, you know, you're going to get it, you know, straighten up. So he was pronouncing war on them. So he must have felt pretty good about himself until he saw God's throne. When he saw the throne, then he goes, war is me. He said, I'm undone. He's not only am I undone, all the people around me are war on them too. We all undone. We all undone. What happened is Isaiah was beginning to see himself when he compared himself with God. That's what happened here. He saw himself, not as, as he was comparing himself with the uh, people of Judah. No, different story. No, you look pretty good then, but once you see God's throne, then you can see. And the same is true for us. Once we learn who God is, once we understand those attributes of God, we're going to see how far short we are, how, how far we fall, you see. We are very lowly when it comes to comparing with God. So you don't want to compare yourself with other people, compare yourself with Jesus Christ. He's the standard. This is how we really get to know who we are. When you really can't truly know who you are until you understand who God is. When you make that comparison, when we make that comparison, then we understand who we are. Amen. We're not all that, as the young folks say today. So now let's go into our, our uh, uh, attributes for today, God's life and immortality. We're going to talk about God's life first and uh, just what do we mean when God is life? 
We know that the scriptures tell us that he is life in several different ways. So he did a research on the word of life. You see, in the Hebrew, Hebrew, it means being alive, active, moving, and flowing. In the Greek, it means uh, living and being and flowing. Life, just moving, being able to move and so forth. So when we look at this and we study this, what we come up with is this, that God is life, he's a living being that is, and he's the source of all other life. Amen. All life there is, God is the source of. Amen. Now let's get scripturally grounded here so we can know that we're not just talking to hear ourselves, we're actually talking about what God said in his word. So let's get scripturally grounded here first of all. Now, here is uh, Moses writing in Deuteronomy. He said, for what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? The living God. When he said the living God, he's talking about God having life. When the Bible talks about the living God, it means that God has life. He is life within himself. He doesn't just have life, but he is life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. He is life within himself. We may say we got life. Yeah, we live. No, we don't have life like God. God is life. We get our life from God, and so does everything else that moves, because life means to be able to move. Let's look at another scripture here. No, but first, let me just say that. He, notice he said here, what mortal, which means, that, of course, that God is immortal. God is a mortal. We talk about we are mortal beings. Mortal beings mean that we are subject to death, that we can die, and we will die. You know, but God is immortal, cannot die. So that, that's a very good point that I want to bring out here as well. Now let's look at another scripture that showed that God is life. He said, uh, this is Daniel now. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Notice what it says. He is the living God and endures forever. He has life inherent. He is life inherent. It's intrinsically within him. It's essential. It is his being. He is life, and everything that has life comes from him. Everything that we see on this planet, on the whole universe really it, uh, comes from God. So here we see another way that God is uh, life. Now God is also the source of all life. He's not just life himself, but he gives life. He gives life to everything that has life. And, and that just doesn't include us. It also includes plants and everything else. Now, let's look at a, a scripture that shows where God gives life. This is one that's very common, and we know this uh, from many uh, to, from times past. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Here's God creating the first man. God is not just life. He gives life. He gives life. He created the first man. He, he is the source of all life. Everything that has life. He created the cell, which is the basing block of human life. And that cell is the basing block of everything that lives, uh, the basing block of a gnat, a mosquito, a fly, a cow, a horse, a camel, a bird, a human being, and everything else, just from that one cell. And you say, well, wait a minute. Now, that's not what they taught me in school. I, I didn't, and then a man named Charles Darwin came up and said, we came from the process of evolution. Didn't he say, did, didn't my teachers teach me this in public school system and in the college and the universities that we got life through the evolutionary process? This evolutionary process is very prevalent in today's public schools and colleges and universities. So let me take a minute and just say a few things about the evolutionary process and what it was started by, by a British biologist by the name of Charles Darwin back in the 1800s. And he wrote a book called On the Origin of the Species, which was published around 1859 or so. And what it says was that all life came from one life form and that uh, it evolved over a period of time. And, and this is how we, man came about. It came about through natural selection, Darwin said. And natural selection just means the survival of the fittest. 
It means that the ones that the strongest survive, or only the strong survive, as one song said years ago. Now, let's just give some examples of this. For example, let's say you have bacteria. Bacteria is a living microorganism. You have good bacteria and bad bacteria. Some bacteria causes diseases, okay? And you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you some antibiotics, you take your antibiotics, those antibiotics in a few days will wipe out most of that, uh, those microorganisms, most of that bacteria. But some of the bacteria may just survive. Maybe just one or two little microorganisms survive. So that microorganism then begins to grow into something else and become strong again. So this is the idea of the strongest of it, the strongest surviving, natural uh, uh, selection, Darwin called it. So they look at the bacteria, they say, oh, well then. Then they look at some other things. They look at, for example, the bird. Let's just take a sparrow. The sparrow was introduced into uh, North America in 1852. And uh, they evolved over a period of time where the sparrow in the south remain about the same, small, but the sparrow in the north began to develop a heavy body with more feathers on him so that he could survive the colder temperatures found in the north. The temperatures are usually colder in the north than the south. So in the south, the sparrow didn't really need to develop this heavy body, but the sparrow in the north evolved. So they say, uh-huh, that's evolution. That's called microevolution. So, okay, let's say, now let's look at another thing here. Look at, look at the dogs. So they look at the dogs. They say, well, these dogs can evolve. And uh, at least you can take a certain dog and you can crossbreed them with another one and you may get something like an Afghan, uh, you may get a bulldog, or you may get a, uh, a collie or a chihuahua or, or some other animal. They say, ha, oh, these animals could evolve. These animals, this is, evolution is real. Now there's lots of scientific proof for this. Lots of scientific evidence for this. This is called microevolution. Yes. Lots of it. Then no one disputes this, okay? We can't argue with this because we got evidence for it. So they said, well, now here's the thing. If these animals can evolve like this and the bacteria can evolve like this in a couple of years, then think about millions of years what would happen to a human being. Or what would happen with the other animals over a period of millions of years. So they reached the conclusion that, well, now, uh, an uh, ape could evolve into a human being if you give him millions of years. You see, this is called macroevolution. Now the ape gradually evolved over millions of years, they believe. This is his theory. And uh, this is how we came about. Obviously, this goes directly against the scriptures, you know that. So we got microevolution, then we got macroevolution. There's lots of evidence for that sparrow and the bacteria and also the dogs. Plenty of evidence with microevolution. There's not one iota of evidence for macroevolution. None whatsoever. Not one iota, not one scintilla, not one drop of evidence for it. Here's what the teachers and the professors do in the public schools and the universities and such. They take the evidence for microevolution and try to prove macroevolution with it. They say, see there? Look at this, student. You know, you see how this thing evolved? You see what happened here? Now, over millions of years, then, you could see that uh, it will turn into a man. That's how we got our life. They are hoodwinking the students. It's a theory, but they teach it in the classrooms as fact. There's not one bit of evidence. Sure, we know that there's plenty of evidence for microevolution, none for macroevolution whatsoever. So now, there are plenty of problems with this. You'll notice, for example, when we talked about the sparrow and the dogs, they changed. Yes, they did. But guess what happened? Those sparrows are still sparrows, even though they evolved they're still within the same species. The dogs became a variety of different dogs, collies, bulldogs, and all kind of dogs, but they're still dogs. They never got out of the species. 
So there's lots of evidence, but you can see the problem here. Now, when they came to uh, macroevolution, what did they say? Well, okay, well, look here, this is turning into a man. Now you're getting from one species going into another species. So they say, well, this ape turned turn into a man. There's not one bit of evidence where any animal ever went from one species to another. God didn't program them that way. He programmed these animals. He programmed the life for changing within the species itself, changing with micro, in the microevolutionary phase, but not macroevolution. They can never change from one species to another. The sparrow still remain a sparrow. The dog still remain a doe. And that ape still remain an ape, never unto a human being. God programmed them with DNA so that they could change within a species. Right. DNA is uh, the, one of the elements that's called deoxyribonucleic acid. It's found in the cell, and it's like a map to tell you who you are, who you're going to be, how tall you're going to be, what color eyes you're going to have, uh, what, what shoe size you're going to need to wear, what color hair you're going to have, how big your nose is going to be. That's DNA. It's like a map for the life. And God put that in the cell. But he never designed it where it would jump from one species to another. Amen. Which is how they hoodwink these poor kids out here. And I see some professors out here, it's just a disgrace for what they're doing. Because now they got evidence that this is completely false. I, I Darwin didn't have this evidence back in the 1800s. We do have the evidence today. So they, but they won't change it. They still got it in practically every biology textbook in the country, and it's just simply a disgrace. Well, who's behind it? The devil, of course. Amen. He has deceived the whole world. Revelation 12 and verse 9. This is what we're seeing happening. This is what they call the evolutionary process. It's just a disgrace, but there's no such thing. When God told Noah to take two animals on the ark, God had already put DNA into those animals where they could evolve into different animals, but within the same species. Never from one species to another, like from an ape to a human, or like from a dog to a, a, a cat, or a bird, or anything else. So you can see where it's going at. God is the creator of all life, and he designed life the way he wanted it to be. Now, there are some Christians who believe that God did create, but he created through evolution. Well, there's a problem with that. That's called theistic evolution. And what they say is, well, God used evolution. He created, yes, but God used that. He used the process of evolution to do it. There's a problem with that. It goes against what the Bible says. For the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 2, 7. That's when he created man. He didn't create no ape and say, you turn into a man a couple of million years from now. Amen. That's not what he did. So theistic evolution, by the way, if you have children or grandchildren, they're being taught this stuff in school. They're going to come to you with this. They're going to say, well, you're an FD of Christians. Doesn't matter because a lot of Christians are hoodwinked with the same thing. Theistic evolution, they call it. They say, well, uh, you know, uh, I know God created, but he created through the process of evolution. Nonsense. God created a man from the dust of the ground, period. Amen. Now, if you going to go against that, then you go against the Bible. Right. You don't believe the Bible, then come talk with us and we'll show you how we know the Bible is from God. Amen. Got a lot of evidence for that, too. Amen. Let's just continue on. I don't want to get too tied up with evolution here. We do teach it in um, Bible study classes, but uh, we had to stop those for a while. Okay. Let's look at another. <coughs> Let's look at another verse here that showed that God is the source of all life. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing, every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kind, and every ring bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Notice that He created every living thing, every living thing we see. Plants, animals, everything, the whole thing, God created. Um, every living thing that was created by God, everything we see in creation. In times past, there was only uh, three beings in existence, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Nothing else existed. But today we have life. So that tells us that God had to have created it because he's the only one in existence. 
A little bit of common sense there that we use to bring this out. Let's look at another scripture that shows God is the creator of all human beings. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. This was the flood, of course, and uh, what God said, he wiped away every living creature that he made, so we know that all living creatures die, except for eight people, Noah and his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their three sons and their wives. So there was only eight people that left. Then he had the animals, two of each kind, which he programmed with DNA to migrate or evolve within their species. Yes, this is what he did. But, he cre but every living creature died. So when he said he destroyed every living creature, that tells you that God created every living creature. And that's the point that we want to make here. There's something else that we like. I like this one pretty much uh, about the resurrection to prove that God is life. That is the resurrection itself that shows that God has life intrinsically. You know the story of Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus was Jesus' friend. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus got sick. Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. Please come and help save him, Jesus. Jesus, okay, you know, I'll be there. Jesus deliberately stayed away two more days because he wanted to prove a point. By the time he got to, where, to Lazarus' home, where they lived with Mary and Martha, Martha said, Jesus, you came too late. Our brother has died. Jesus said, your brother will live. Martha said, I know he's going to live in the resurrection at the last day. Right. Here's what Jesus, how Jesus responded to her when she said that. He, she said, I will respond. He said, she said, I will, Lazarus will live. My brother will live in the resurrection at the last day. Notice what Jesus said to her. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me <coughs> will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now notice what Jesus told her. I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. He's life and resurrection. In other words, God not only gives life, he has the ability to take life away and give it back again. Now, how's that for power, huh? Talk about how great thou art. God gives life. He could take that life from me, which he's proven, and give it back again. <clears throat> we always read this scripture at funerals. In fact, I use it when I do grief counseling. We use this scripture because you don't have to worry about your loved one who has died. God can take your life today and give it back to you tonight. He is in control of life. He is the giver of life. He is life. So he takes it, he gives it, takes it, give it back again. He can do that as long as he want to. Amen. We don't have to sit here and worry about somebody dying. Amen. They're going to be resurrected anyway. Everybody's going to be resurrected. So we don't even have to worry about that. Jesus Christ made this very clear. Now some people say, well, you know, you said that God created everything. Now you also said that God is a simple being. Well, life itself is very complex, so how could a simple being create something that's so complex? We know that life is complex. If you take the cell, for example, one little cell has enough information in it to fill 1,000 volumes of an encyclopedia. That's one cell, something that we can't see with the naked eye. It has enough information in it to fill to fill 1,000 volumes of a set of encyclopedias. Wow. One cell, and we have over 30 trillion cells in the body. That's a lot of information you're walking around with, isn't it? Amen. You're loaded with information. Too bad we don't draw on it like we should, but we got it anyway. <laughs> we'll be drawing on it later. But when they say, uh, well, how could a, we say God is simple, a simple being, that's his attribute, and how could he make something complex? It doesn't mean that he can't make something complex. When we say God is a simple being, what it means is that God doesn't have any parts. He's not composed of anything. He's one simple, infinite, holy, majestic being with no parts. That's what we mean when we say simplicity, when he's a simple being. Not that he can't create things that are complex. We see complex things all the way all around. The brain itself is extremely complex. Scientists have been trying to find out for thousands of years why an elephant brain, which is so big, can't contain the information that a human brain has. 
Why is we so much smarter than, than the elephant and the elephant brain is so much bigger? The problem is they miss the spiritual element in there. See, we have a God made man with a spirit. See, there's a spirit in man, Job 32 and verse 8. And the wisdom of the Almighty gives them understanding. We got that understanding from the spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but the human spirit. So every human being could do things. We could design things and make things and so forth and make them differently and so forth. But the problem we have here is what the word we talked about last week, which is ineffability. We don't have the words to act to adequately and sufficiently and comprehensively describe God. So we say God is a simple being and people think, well, that means he ain't too bright. Listen, he can't make nothing complex if he's so simple. That's not what it means. We run into that problem and we try to describe God, but we don't have any uh, other words that we can use, so we come up with simplicity to, to explain that he uh, uh, is one being with no parts. He's not composed of anything. Now, let's talk a little bit about the theological basis for God's life. We talked about God's pure actuality in the past. That's one of the attributes that he has. He is pure actuality. Pure actuality simply means that God has no potential to become, to become anything other than what he is. He has not one bit of potential to be something else. It's impossible for him to be something else. That's pure actuality. Well, life is a form of actuality or being. So if God is pure actuality, then it follows that uh, he is life. Life is being. Those two work very well together. Also, is e in eternality. We talked about God being eternal and what that means. It has no beginning, no end, and outside of time. And because he's eternal, this means that uh, with his life, it also, uh, his life, is all, life itself was also be going to be eternal within himself. So, uh, God's attribute of life is rooted in his eternality and his pure actuality as well. He is life. He give all life. He's the source of all life. Animals, plants, and anything else that you could think of that might be living or whatever category you might want to put them in, God is the source of that life if it's moving and has life within it. This goes back to the question, of God give life to everything, but who give life to God? Or like some people like to say, well, who created God? Well, God is eternal. As we know, God had no creation. He always existed. No beginning, no end, and outside of time. Now, that may be kind of hard for some people. There's plenty of evidence for this, but here's one simple way you can think of it. Think of a time, if you can, when there was absolutely nothing. There was no God the Father, no God the Son, and no Holy Spirit. There was no matter, energy, space, or time. There was absolutely nothing. No oceans, or seas, or skies, or no, no galaxies. Absolutely nothing. No space or nothing. If that were a case, if, that were the, if there were such a case and there was such a time, what would we have today? Nothing. Because you can't get something from nothing. So the fact that you can't get something from nothing, and we look around and we see a lot of somethings, that tells you that someone had to have always existed. Amen. Someone had to have been here forever. This is just a common sense way of looking at this thing when you talk, when the people ask the question, who created God? You see, someone, had, if you say that someone created God, then you have to say, who created that person who created God? Then you gotta go and say, who created that person that created God that created that person? So you keep going back, 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 and back. But it's impossible to go back into infinity with a finite set of information. That's impossible. You can't continue going back with an infinite series of regression. It, it, uh, it's unrealistic. So someone had to have always existed. The Bible said that's God. That's what they call it, God. Now, historical basis for God's life, and we say that uh, all of our early church fathers, not all of them, but most of them, uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Theophilus, some of them didn't write on this, but the, the, at least these three wrote on it and taught on it. Medieval church fathers, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, they wrote on this, talked on this. Reformation church fathers like Martin Luther, they wrote on it, talk on this. So we're on solid ground. But even if they didn't write on it, talk on it, we got the Holy Bible, the Word of God, and we know that the Bible says that God uh, is life. Jesus made it very clear, I am life. Now let's talk about God's immortality. Immortality. Now, 
When we say God is immortal, we probably heard the word that God is immortal. We heard that word before. Uh, we heard immortal and immortality and so forth. But what does it mean when you say God is immortal? It means that God has, is immortal, cannot die, and it is his, his naturally and essentially, meaning that it's him. I, I don't want to say a part of him because none of these attributes are a part of God. They are God. For example, we say, you can't just say God has love. God is love. Right. So, see, this is him. This is who he is. So God is immortal. He is immortality. Period. So this is what we mean when, he had, when we say God is immortal. He's the only one that is immortal. Okay? You might say, well, we have immortality. Yes, we have it from this point on. But we had a beginning. God didn't have a beginning. So we don't have immortal like God. We don't have it within us. We don't have that immortality within us. Now, there are people, there are plenty of gods out here. You know, you got the Greek gods and the Roman gods. You got the Roman gods like Apollos and, and you got Venus and you got uh, Neptune. You got a bunch of Greek gods like Zeus and Poseidon and some of the other. All those gods are dead or will die. God will never die. He's a model. Can't die. Impossible. But God is a model, which means that death is swallowed up by him. There's no such thing as death with God. Can't be. Let's look at some Bible, scriptural basis for God's immortality. And uh, now to the King Eternal, immortal. This is Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. He said, "Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever." Amen. Paul is saying to Timothy, that, describing that God is immortal. He mentioned the term itself, immortal. Came right out and said. Let's look at another verse, and this is continued with the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy. Uh, here he says, Who alone is immortal, and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and glory forever. Amen. Now, he said that God alone is immortal. No living thing is immortal but God. He is immortality, intrinsically, inherent within his nature. It is he, immortal. He is it. He has it within himself. Now, God does give us immortality, but again, that's because we started, we had a beginning, and we are immortal from this point on. You see, but God never had a beginning with his immortality. He was always immortal. So don't think that we are immortal like God. No way. Let's look at another one here. God also gives his immortality just like he gives life. He, all, he gives his immortality to us. Certain people. Who are these people God gives his immortality to? Let's look and see. He gives his immortality to certain people. For God so loved the world that he gave his, only, his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So here now God is giving immortality. Shows that God gives immortality to those who believe in his son Jesus Christ. That's you and me. We've accepted Jesus our Lord and Savior. Now we are immortal. And again, that doesn't mean to be immortal like God is. God is immortality in, intrinsically, but he gives us that immortality. From the moment we accept Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, receive the Holy Spirit who indwells us now, we've just started on the road to immortality. We will never die. We will never, ever die. Incidentally, uh, no one is going to ever die, really. No one is ever going to die. There's some people that uh, think that, um, you see, once sperm and egg meet, a life has begun. Once that happens, it never goes out of existence. Never goes out of existence. What happens is you're going to live. The question is, where are you going to live forever? Everybody's going to live forever. The question is where? You got two choices according to the Bible, heaven or hell. God said, therefore, choose. He can't make us come to him. He can't make us love him. No more than we can make one another love each other. We can't make ourselves love each other. God gives us the Holy Spirit and woos us and encourages us and inspires us to help love one another, him first and everyone else. This is what he does. But he can't make us love each other. He can't make us love him. So those who re reject him or refuse to love him, which is the same thing. Anytime you refuse to love God, you just, re you just reject him. Once you do that, then, of course, God said, well, you're okay, well, you can go your way. You don't want to be with me for all eternity? All right. I feel sorry for you. 
but you're going to be in hell for eternity. That's where you will live. Because God didn't create anybody to die, to go, to cease to exist, I should say. Because the word death just means separation. He didn't intend for anybody to do that. So everybody's going to live forever. Question is where you're going to live. And that brings me to something else I want to bring on here. Is, um, when you live forever, that's not the same as eternal life. Living forever and eternal life are two different things. Living forever means you're never going to die. Eternal life means uh, to know God, the Father, the one and only God, and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. John 17 and verse 3. In other words, eternal life is when you're saved, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. Amen. That's what eternal life is. Not dying means you just don't go out of existence. So there's a difference between living forever and having eternal life. Everybody's going to live forever, but not everybody will have eternal life. The definition for eternal life is found in John, 9, uh, John 17 and verse 3. John 17 and verse 3, that's John tell you exactly what eternal life is. In fact, he says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Amen. Love that definition because it says it all very clear and plain. You know Jesus Christ, you accept him as Lord and Savior, you see him. You don't, you're not see it, you're going to hell. No one is going to study, live, not, not live. Immortality is a great thing, a wonderful thing to have. And he, uh, in this scripture, he said you have eternal life. Now that's immortality for us because we keep going on and on. But it's not the same thing uh, when you really look at the specific definition for in immortality. Now, um, you look at, the, when I was uh, young growing up, they had a television program that came on called The Adventures of Superman. It, <laughs> somebody know they're telling the age around me. <laughs> Adventures of Superman. And it would start off every Sunday, every Saturday morning, millions of people would be tuning into that television set to watch the Superman. And they start off the Adventures of Superman. And faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Then the people on the ground go, look, up in the air, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. <laughs> then the announcer goes, yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from another planet that came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Yes, it's Superman. Now, I notice what he said, strange visitor from another planet that came to earth with power and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Far beyond those of mortal men. In other words, they were saying Superman is immortal. But it was so much, so intriguing, so, so, so exciting to watch this man fly through the air with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal man. And all of us wish we could fly through the air, you know, the kids just sitting there in front of the TV. Wow. They had a Superman outfit, you know. I never did get one. I was, I was, I was more into the cowboy. I was, I was more with the Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, so I got my cap guns and stuff. And my cowboy hat, cowboy outfit. But, but Superman would fly through the air and everybody wanted to be like Superman. You know, we played games being Superman. I said, it's got to be nice to be able to fly. Sometimes he'd go to the other planets and all of that. And I said, oh, if I could just do that. Little did I know that I will be able to do that. We will be able to do that. We will be able to fly, leap tall buildings at a single bound, faster than a speeding bullet, and more powerful than a locomotive. That's how we are going to be. All of us, because we're going to get new bodies in the last stage of salvation. That last stage is called glorification. Once we are glorified, we'll be able to fly through there. And we won't need any wings to do it. We just, and no one need no cape to do it. We're just going to fly all over the place from planet to planet. I'm going to get sporty with mine. <laughs> I can see some soul brothers out there getting hip with it, flying, <laughs> flying through the air, you know, the greatest of ease, you know. Wow, that's going to be something. But it's going to be a wonderful thing. God has some tremendous, wonderful things in store for us. Amen.
plentiful things. That's why the psalmist said we're going to have eternal pleasures at the right hand of God. Amen. Eternal pleasures. I want to look at one more scripture I think I have here before we uh, get to the end here. But God's immortality. Let me just see. I believe I had another one on here. Yeah. Uh, knowing. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Knowing that God is life helps us through. Oh, that's the wrong one. This is how, how it helps us. Let me go back just a little bit. Okay. Who alone is a mortal? He's talking about a mortal. And who lives in an unapproachable light? That's the one that told, uh, told me to give. I might have already mentioned that. But what it's saying is that God alone is a mortal. No one is a mortal except God. Okay, that's it. Now let's talk about the theological basis for God's immortality. And uh, God's immortality is rooted in his life and in his necessity and in his simplicity. Uh, we, we know that God has life intrinsically and essentially, and what has life essentially cannot cease to exist. It has to uh, continue on. So we know that his life, his immortality is rooted in his life. Also, it's rooted in his necessity. God is a necessary being, meaning that it's impossible for him to go out of existence. And uh, with this life, it fits right into that as well. Also, it follows from his simplicity. God is a simple being, which means he has no parts. So if he has life, he is life all over. He is life within himself, intrinsically and essentially. He is life. So now then, historical basis for God's immortality. Early church fathers, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, all agreed with the, with the, what the Bible says on this. They agreed with God's immortality. The medieval church fathers, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas, Aquinas, Aquinas, they all agreed, wrote on this, taught this, and also uh, John Calvin as one of the uh, Reformation church fathers. Now, so we see that God is life and that God is immortal. He is this. We, we use the, we talk about him having it. And I keep emphasizing this. We say he has this, but actually he is this. All of these attributes is what he is. Not that he has, he is. But we talk this way because we go right back to uh, the attribute of ineffability, which is really not an attribute at all, but what it does say that we can't, there's no language that's sufficient to adequately and comprehensively describe who God is. So we do the best we can, and we try to talk where we know we are communicating with one another so that we can understand what's going on. The Bible is written the same way. It's written in, in nine different languages, a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, the, the, the hydro, uh, one of the ways that it does this is through anthropomorphic language, which is uh, we God had the man write the Bible in such a way where we can understand and comprehend it. But God is far, far advanced or far more higher than all of this that we can think about when we talk about words. Now, how does this help us? Knowing about God's life and about God's immortality. How does it help us? Okay. For number one, knowing that God is life helps us through the grieving process because we know that God will resurrect everyone. God is going to, he is life. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about death of a loved one, death of ourselves, because he's going to resurrect everybody. He gives life. He's in control of it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. He can give life anytime he wants, resurrect it anytime he wants. Because he is life. You don't have to worry about somebody who died. The only thing that dies anyway is the body. That's all. We just separate from our body. The term death simply means separation. That's all it means. So when we understand this attribute of God, that God is life, we know that he has total, absolute, complete control of every aspect of life, everything that involves life, everything with life being created, everything with life being taken away, everything that life being restored. He got it all covered. And he can do it just by thinking. He doesn't even have to speak it. Just say this thinking. Boy, that's power. Talk about omnipotence, attribute of omnipotence. That's God. That's the kind of God you and I worship. See. Okay. Another way this helps us. 
Knowing that God gives life increases our faith because we have great assurance that we too will have. When we know who God is and that God is life, we know that we are going to live forever ourselves. We're going to have eternal life because God is life. He has control of it. So our faith is boosted just by understanding these attributes. By the way, when we study these attribute roots and go through these attributes, we want to think about them and incorporate them into our minds and into our spirit so that we can apply them in our lives as we read and as we think and as we say something, as we do something. Apply these attributes. It boosts your faith. It makes you stronger in your faith because you know who God is. You have a better understanding who we are worshiping, who we are dealing with here. Okay, let's continue on. We got one or two more uh, benefits here. We know that the only way that we can have immortality is except Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. You may have children, grandchildren, cousins, friends, neighbors, co-workers, enemies. They, you know, you want to be a witness to them, you just tell them, see, listen, God loves you. He want to give you uh, immortality. How do I get this immortality? You say, well, I'll tell you. First of all, I have it. If you want it, give me some money. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, you got to talk to them and let them know that God is immortal. He'll gladly give it to you. He wants to give it to you. Amen. Just accept his son. Accept Jesus Christ, Lord, and Savior. So it's a very good talking point if you want to deal with uh, somebody who is serious about learning about immortality. Excellent talking point. Ex excellent uh, witnessing tool that we can use, the immortality of God. And finally, it makes us better equipped to give an answer for the hope that is within us, as is true with all of these attributes of God. All of them are enable us to be better able to give a defense for what we believe. As Peter, we read right here, and Peter, we are always to be ready to give that defense for the hope that is within us, but to do it with gentleness and respect. So then, uh, we, these attributes, knowing about these attributes enable us to do this. And as I said at the beginning of this message, when we uh, study these attributes and learn these attributes, we want to be able to use them. We prayerfully ask God to have us use them in our lives. This is not just some academic lesson we are talking here. This is something that will change our lives, change our lives forever, which is really what matters because that's the only thing we are going to take into the kingdom with us, what God is teaching us. All this other stuff that they're teaching us doesn't mean amount to a hill of beans. But we do have this. Next time, two weeks from now, we are going to be talking about God's holiness and his righteousness. Now we're getting into more of the communicable attributes of God. Most of the attributes we have covered thus far are incommunicable attributes of God or non-communicable attributes of God, which he can't give us, like omnipotence, eternality, uh, omnipresence and so forth, infinity. He can't give those to us because we had a beginning and we are finite. But these attributes we are talking about here now, he does give, give these to us. And holiness and righteousness, as we'll see in two weeks, those are some that he does give us. And we need to use them. Anytime God gives you something, he wants you to use it to help other people, to help bring others into a relationship with Jesus Christ, to serve others. He said, in as much as you're doing it unto others, you're doing it unto me. If you want to serve God, serve others. God will take care of you. You don't have to worry about yourself. That's what true love is, looking away from yourself and at others. That's what you want to do. So then, let us go before the throne of grace in prayer and thank God for the message that he gave us today. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you bless us that we can talk on your word. Thank you for teaching us, Lord. And thank you for helping us to learn all of these wonderful things that you're teaching us. The knowledge that you're giving us, Lord, is just, oh, it's just so great, Lord. It, it just, we just don't have the words to describe our uh, appreciation for it. We can just say we are eternally and infinitely grateful for what you're doing for us and teaching us and training us and to have this mind in us which is also in Christ Jesus. And we pray that you'll help us take all this with us, Lord. Help us to use it as we go to and fro in the world to bring glory to you in heaven. Just bless us, Lord, with all of this and that you will be well pleased. So we just thank you and give you honor, glory, and praise and do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, may the good Lord bless you and keep you May he uh, shine his face towards you and be gracious to you. May he turn his head towards you and give you peace. Uh, may you have a happy, enjoyable, say a productive week. And remember, above all things, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
Hold off. Thank you that we could give an offering now, and we pray that you'll bless this offering, help us to be cheerful givers. We know that you love cheerful givers, and we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to do just that and give us wisdom, knowledge, insight, and understanding in using these monies to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Help us to use these monies so we can reach more people for Jesus to help bring more people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We thank you, pray to you, and ask this in Jesus Christ's holy and sacred name, and we say amen. amen. Praise the Lord.
God, you, you, you gave us this life, and we are just yes. so, so grateful. Yeah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We can walk today by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know, he gave us this life, but you know, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, would have rather have died than to ever live without you. Amen. Amen. We need to give our lives. We need to turn our every being over to this this one that, that has connected us to the Father, the, the true God man, amen. The, he's the one that showed us what humanity was supposed to be like. The second Adam, amen. Come on, here we go. I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign.
Beautiful. Now let's go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've blessed us and enabled us to have this service for you today, Lord. We thank you that you have an audience and we just worship you, praise you, and glorify your name. And we just so grateful that you've blessed us in this way. We just thank you, Lord, that we can move more now into the balance of this afternoon and into the week. We ask you to help us take all of the knowledge with us that we gain today, Lord, and help us continue to worship you and adore you and love you more than anything. We ask you to keep your angels upon us and protect us from serious hurt, danger, harm, danger, accident, inconveniences, viruses, and sickness. Everything is bad, Lord. You can protect us and keep us safe from it. So we just thank you, Lord, for blessing us and we worship and adore you. We give you all our glory and praise and do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. My beloved brothers and sisters, as you go forth this week, have a happy, enjoyable, safe, productive week. And keep your eyes fixed on Jesus above any and all things else.